I said I'm gonna not move from here. <laughs> All right, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining me for this talk, uh, Machine Learning in the Browser. And I'm really happy that we could like start with some fluffiness the day and gonna end with some fluffiness in this room. So I'm really, really proud of that. So for those who don't know me yet, oh, this is not working. Oh, wait, because I turned it off. Yes, this, this is me. Hello. Yes, please come in. Hi, Mia. Hi. No, take your time. <laughs> All right, so this is me. Um, this is actually not me. So um, there's a company called Lee and Lee, and they've basically been haunting me my entire life because pe my friends come up to me who are also in the industry sometimes, and they're like, do you know of this company that's named Lee and Lee? So like, this is a friend of mine most recently was like, uh, Haha, ha, if I was a computer, and like, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be super polite and just like it. And he liked it himself again. Like, he liked his own post that he posted to my timeline. And he was so happy with this post that he commented on it again with a smiley face. So, this is basically my relationship with the company Lee and Lee. So, they've been haunting me my whole life, like I said. And I want to ask you to help me with something. This is the situation on Twitter right now. I have, I'm shy of 190 followers, uh, 191. As soon as I hit 892, I'm gonna ask Twitter to give me the check mark. <laughs> and that will be the first step when people start asking them, like, do you know the speaker, Lian Lee? And they're like, oh, of course we do. Like, we've been in this business for 30 years now. So uh, yeah, please follow me on Twitter uh, or on GitHub. Or on Mass, I have three followers on Mastodon, so if you could like follow me there, that would be great. I don't think Lian Li is on there, so I might get like a check mark there, just like that. So um, yes, that was the joke, the introduction joke. Um, something else I do, I'm a software engineer at uh, Container Solutions. Um, it's a company doing cloud native consultancy uh, based in Amsterdam. It's really not that interesting, I'm not gonna talk about my company because that's my day job. During the night, or any other time of day, uh, I'm a machine learning enthusiast. And by that I mean I have no education, actually, on machine learning. I just did a course uh, on Coursera, which I highly recommend. It's like a 12-week sucking out your soul kind of like super math intense course. But it's like at the other end, you're like, OK, I did something with my life. So I uh, highly recommend this course. Um, I'm gonna show you, uh, I think I have a link on the slide later. So, okay, uh, let's talk about machine learning. Why do we want to do machine learning? I think, who hasn't heard of machine learning yet? Okay, well, maybe other way around. Who has heard of machine learning? Okay, that's most. Um, okay, so for this to be make sense, uh, have to we have to take a look at how S expert system works. So expert systems is what you build when you do conventional coding. And the idea is kind of that you have a solution, and the solution is your code. You have a problem, you're trying to find a solution, you write this code as a solution. And for that, you kind of need like a person who's usually a developer. And the developer has to maintain the code, write the code, expand the code, so everything kind of funnels through him. And for him to do a good job, he has to do things like read documentation, like use third-party libraries maybe, or maybe has to talk to domain experts. Um, but the important thing here to take away from the slide basically is that everything goes to this one person and he has to have a perfect understanding of the system. Now, if we look at machine learning, it's kind of different. Um, so the solution in machine learning is a model. The model is a statistical model. So everything's kind of represented in numbers and there are no, like, if you didn't implement this edge case, where there's no really implementing of edge cases, it still works, it doesn't break, it just gives you maybe like a weird number. Um, and the model is not built by hand by a developer, it's just spit out by code, by a machine learning alg algorithm. So you run an algorithm and it gives you a model in the end. I'll explain to you later how that works. And for this to work, basically, for this code to run efficiently or to do what it's supposed to do, you need some data, and you need some kind of like data or machine learning experts. So these 
data ML experts do not necessarily need to be domain experts, although it does make sense for them to understand the domain, but uh, mainly they need to understand the statistical, basically, behavior of this pattern that they're trying to uh, learn and adapt to. So everything in the end kind of hinges on the data. The data has to be the right amount, the right format, and um, yeah, that's kind of the, our job here in machine learning. Um, so machine learning basically, the, kind, the, the way it works is pretty simple. It's like how we learn as well. Um, for one, there's experience. You need experience. Um, that's the number of data points. So like you have like different kinds of um, uh, data points that represent different you know, instances of the behavior um, you want to basically adapt to. And then the other thing, the same thing how we learn, is repetition. That's uh, basically our number of training iterations. Um, so you are gonna have to take the same uh, data points and then just train them a lot of times. And by repeating, you kind of learn the pattern behind it. So pretty much this is kind of how we imagine people to learn as well. Right, um, then the other thing that people have already asked me about, like why does everything have to be JavaScript? Like can, can't you just not do that in JavaScript? Yes, good point. You could also not do it in JavaScript, but where would the fun be, right? No, well, there are some arguments that I could make for client-side machine learning, and I think you could think of some as well. For one, like, speed. Not everyone lives in, like, a first-world country. Some of us live in Germany, where the internet speed is not always that great. Um, and then my, maybe you don't want to wait, like, two minutes for the server to answer you with your prediction or with whatever you're gonna uh, get from it. Then the other thing is availability. Again, if you live in Germany, you don't always have internet, so maybe you just can't connect to the server, and so that maybe you want to do the prediction on your client, on your website, or on your phone. And then the third um, argument that I could bring is uh, security. So maybe you don't want to send your images to a third-party server to train on it and then predict something. Maybe you just want to do everything on your phone or on your own uh, client to have more control over your data. So all these arguments, I think, are valid enough to see if like, you could build something with JavaScript so it runs in your browser, right? Uh, all right, um, I want to try to explain the basic principles of machine learning to you, and for that, I think the best way is to think of an example that makes sense and then try to translate like those really messy terms to things that you know, we all can understand. Um, all right, and the example that I picked is complementary colors. So the idea here is to input a specific color, which is RGB channel. So we're inputting three values, which is the value for red, um, green, and blue. And then we're outputting, we're trying to predict the um, complementary color. Complementary color, in case you don't know, it's basically like the opposite color of the color spectrum. Yeah, you are like, no one's totally lost here, good. All right, so um, let's talk about terminology for a while, because I'm gonna probably switch back and forth between the machine learning words and normal um, words. Oh God, I have the best words today. Um, so I'm gonna like do some like simple diagrams so we can all be on the same page when I try to explain it later on. So first, we have our input. An input, it be our color, um, the color we want to uh, do the complementary color prediction on. We pass that input into like a function, something like a function, and then we get an output. That is the basic idea of any system, right? If we were to do it um, not with machine learning, but with an expert system, we would also have something like that. Now, if you look at like how we do it in machine learning, the inputs become our features. And in this case, we have three features because we have like a value for red, a value for green, and a value for blue. Then the function would be a network. And like the network, like it's a, it's a network of nodes, right? And each net node is already a function, but like the entire network would be like, like a total, like a function of functions, if you know what I'm getting at here. But we can look at it for now as like one function, we pass something in, and then we get something out, and the output 
would be our prediction. Now, um, network and prediction have the same color here because the prediction is always dependent on a specific network. If you, in, if you put in the same values in the exact same network, you would always get the exact same prediction. Now, um, if you want to, like, if you're starting uh, with machine learning and you're starting with a new network, usually your prediction is pretty mm, crummy um, in the beginning. So what we kind of need to train is to also know, in this case, what our desired output would be. Like, what is the color that we do want it to predict? And this is called the target. This is what we want to predict. Um, right, and so, uh, in this diagram, what I wanted to show kind of is that the blue and the green ones, this is the data that we actually need to do the training. Because the, the network and the prediction is something that we're going to come up, by, like, that we're going to train by ourselves, but we need to have like a good data set. Um, that's the input and um, the target, or the features in the target. So this is just important for you to understand. So uh, complementary colors is actually a really good example because um, we don't have to do a lot of data mining. We don't have to go out and you know try to find like labeled data. It's pretty easy to just generate data on the fly when you just want to try stuff out. Um, so this is kind of how our input generation could look like. We just basically have to generate a random value between zero and 255, and then you know do that three times, put it in an array. That's basically one random color. And we just do that like 10,000 times for 10,000 data points. And then there's a function for the output, which is the, so this is our desired output, right? Um, I didn't put the full function there, but there's a link to Stack Overflow if you want to check it out how to compute uh, complementary colors. Um, just know that in the end you again have um, an array with values between 0 and 250. All right, um, to make it kind of easier to understand what we're getting at here, how we're trying to build this thing, I created this nice handy checklist. So first thing we need, data. Got that. Next thing, kind of need a network thingy to make a prediction, right? When we have that, doing something awesome, in the end, it's going to be awesome. That's all we need to know for now. We need a network, then do something awesome, going to be awesome. Um, the nice thing is that we don't have to implement every network by itself. There's like Google um, doing stuff like DeepLearn.js. And DeepLearn.js is, um, ba is based on TensorFlow. I don't know if ever, any of you have ever heard of TensorFlow. Yes, I see some heads nodding and fingers going up. Yes, cool. So um, DeepLearn.js, or as it's called now actually, I think they released it like last week. Thank you, Google. Um, it's called TensorFlow.js now. It's like I said before, they changed the API, so the code I'm showing you might not be 100% accurate. Um, but you can still, like, if you still can get the npm package of DeepLearn uh, version 0.4, I think, then you can still check out the repos my repository. Then you will uh, get the right version. Anyways, so DeepLearn.js uh, provides us with a way to build neural networks, and it's actually kind of straightforward really straightforward, so I'm hoping that, you know, I can show you this and you can, like, do it for yourself, um, even though, you know, it's not exactly like this uh, anymore. But so a neural network, like I said before, it's a network made of nodes. And um, we don't look at each single node, we look at these columns of nodes. And like I said before, each one is a node, and you have, like, different columns and they can have a different number of nodes doesn't really matter, it just matters that it's a single column. They, you can't have like weird other shapes. It just has to be columns. And then uh, you have this blue input, basically, and the green output. So the input is our features, the output is um, our prediction. In this case, we only have two output nodes, but that's just because I drew it this way. And the important thing to understand is that each node is connected to all the other nodes in the next layer. And like, like, I said, like each node connected to all the other nodes, they're not connected like in the same layer. It's always to the next one. And then to the next one. Right, so um, let's look at one single node to try to understand what's happening there. Um, so in this case, this node, like the layer before has three nodes, the layer after it has three nodes, and we're just looking at one node in this layer. And we're getting our inputs from the layer before, and those are like three different values. 
and kind of like doing something with them, like adding them together to create one output, and we output this same value to all the other nodes. So we're receiving three different inputs, but we're outputting the same value. And now you will think for yourself, like, okay, if we're just adding all the inputs, then all the nodes in this layer will output the same value. This is kind of how the magic of machine learning works, is that each node has these weights. It has like a, like parameters for each of those inputs to define how important this input is to understand this pattern. So maybe if we have um, com a complementary color prediction, one of the inputs is, let's say, the weather today, then hopefully the system will kind of learn that this is a very, like, it doesn't really matter, this input, and like, will give it a very, very small weight. So once you multiply it, it becomes like almost, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter in your, in your sum in the end. That's kind of the idea. So um, by that, that's the magic, basically, of uh, neural networks. So the weights are property of the node. So they're not property of the input, they're like the, the node has um, the weights. And you have one weight for each input to define how important that input is. And all the weights in one network, that, those basically represent your model, because that's basically what your model is. It tells you, um, of all the inputs, those are the, how, how important are the inputs, and then I'm gonna I can calculate them, and then I can give you like a value in the end that kind of tells you the probability of what you want to predict, what's gonna happen, or complementary colors, or whatever you want to predict. So, we need our weights, those are the mo most important things. All right, uh, in Deep Learn JS or TensorFlow.js, the columns of a network are represented by a thing that's called tensor, so um, a tensor is a layer, it's just one column. And the reason why it has to be columns is because we're doing a lot of vector and matrix multiplication and that is also why machine learning is so powerful because we can do a lot of calculations uh, in parallel with that and uh, can do like, can go over a lot of data in a pretty short amount of time. Um, so yeah, that's why we need columns and rows where uh, each column represents basically a, um, Layer and a row represents a data set. I'm gonna explain that later, don't, yeah. Everything's gonna come together in the end, I promise. All right, um, two we have two different kinds of tensors. The one kind is a placeholder where, okay, we need a name for that, which is just like to, to find it basically, and then we need a size. So we have to know how many nodes have to be in this placeholder. And we need a placeholder to input static values or output like static values, basically. For example, um, for our input and target tensor. This, so this is how the code looks. We um, asked DeepLearn, the, the library, to give us a graph, because the graph is where we get all our fancy tensors and everything from. And then we have like this placeholder that is input tensor, so that's where we put in our features. And the target tensor, this is where we put in our desired output, what we want it to um, output. And since those are fixed values, we know them from the data set that we created, um, those are placeholders. The other kind of tensor is called, in this case, I call a fully connected layer. Basically, okay, we need a name again, we need a size again, but here we need to give the fully connected layer an input layer so it knows which layer it has to connect to. And it's called fully connected because, like I explained before, the node um, is connected to all the nodes of the, of the next layer. Um, you can have like different kinds of connections, but I'm just gonna show you like the super basic one, basically. Um, so this code goes, is, might look a little bit complicated. Um, we're starting with, this, with our input tensor. This is, this is the input tensor for this function where we uh, add like a new connected layer. I'm gonna show you the code for the function in a minute. Just wanted to show you that we take this input tensor, adding another layer, then adding another layer, then adding another layer, and then we're adding the last layer, which is our prediction. And these are the ind indices for our layers. Just saying, like, this is the first one, the second one, and so on. And these are the node sizes. So, uh, the prediction tensor, of course, again, has to be uh, three nodes because we want like three values RGB. Uh, and this is what the code looks like. So um, 
again, we have to call the graph to give us this like dense layers. We're giving it a name, giving it the input layer. So where are the inputs coming from? From the layer before. And then uh, layer size, okay. This is an activation function. Normally in the layer, all you, have to, all you do is um, multiply each input with its weight and then adding that together. This is a super simple activation. So if you, if you hadn't have an activation function, if this was undefined, you would just get the result from uh, the calculation I just explained to you. Once you have an um, input uh, activation function, x is basically the result of you know, the multiplication and the sum. Um, and then we pass it through here. This function is called rectifier linear unit blah blah blah. All it does is if x is smaller than zero, it outputs zero, and if x is bigger than zero, it just outputs x. It's not really, it just sounds very complicated. And then uh, this is the bias um, bool. Um, we need a bias here because in case uh, we get a zero here, the next layer would think that the node before was not activated because it's getting a zero, um, but we want the node to be activated no matter what. Because otherwise, it would just basically think that there was no node or it's like um, really unimportant, but that's not what it is. It's just like, unfortunately, we just got a zero. They have to add a bias that's just adding plus one to the end of the uh, calculation uh, so we know that the node was activated. It's really not that, like, it's not that important. If it, we're just gonna build stuff and we're just gonna put bias, yes, because someone told me that bias is good. Like in machine learning, not in real life. All right, um, let's go through our checklist again because I already forgotten what I was talking about. So we have our data. We now built a network. Now we have to do something awesome and then we're gonna have something awesome, right? So let's talk about this awesome thing we have to do. What, like, do you have an idea what we have to do now? We have our network, we have our data. What do we, like, anyone have an idea? Yes, yes, very good. Yes, we have to train our network because it has to become better. So how do we do this? Let's just think about it like very high level, very abstract. So we need to kind of find a metric that tells us how good it is, how good our uh, machine is uh, predicting right now, then we're gonna change something and then we're gonna check the metric again. And that's how, it, how we kind of be better. That's kind of how I learned things, you know? I was like, I, I got like feedback, changed something, got other feedback, and like, oh, I'm on the right track. So, uh, let's talk about this metric thing. Um, so we, I call it <laughs> uh, cost loss or cost or loss, and I'm trying to explain this uh, graph to you. Um, so this is the x-axis, which is our input. Let's just imagine we only have one input value right now, and this is the output value that we have. So if I'm showing you this, it basically means this is a model or like a system, a pattern, where when we input 100, we're gonna get an output of like, let's say 100. I, I'm not seeing that really well. We input like 40, we're gonna get like, I don't know, 50, 40 something. And then if we input like 200, we're gonna get like 120 maybe. So this is our, our uh, reality that we're trying to uh, approximate. And this is our prediction. This is what our network is predicting right now. So what that means is that the distance between the actual target value and what we predicted for this x that distance is our cost or our loss. So that's like how far we are away from the actual correct prediction or correct result or target. And um, so because we're not like doing all the calculations sequentially but like parallel, the cost function is all the distances. All the distances for all the x's that we have, that's our cost um, for this uh, model. All right, so um, if we want to implement it in DeepLearn.js, all we have to do is find, like choose an algorithm. In this case, I'm just gonna choose mean squared error and you don't have to understand what it does. If you're interested, do the machine learning course because um, it gets kind of masked C and I don't really have the time to explain it right now. So we need an algorithm and then we need the target tensor and the prediction tensor. 
makes sense because we have to like calculate the difference, like the distance between those two. So we calculate the distance between what we want to have and what we actually have, and then feed it in like some kind of function. Um, oh yeah, the mean squared error, what it does is basically it squares the error, so a big error will always be like even more ridiculously big, will make the loss even greater than like a smaller one, if you square it. So and the implementation or the, the code is actually super simple in deep learn. We're just calling the graph and saying, oh, give me mean squared cost, that's the function I'm calling, and then we're passing in the target tensor and the prediction tensor. Pretty simple. Right, um, the next thing we need to talk about is the thing that actually changes values. That actually, so we have this metric, right? And then the next thing was that we need to change something. To change something on our network, we need this thing that uh, Debron calls an optimizer. So in this graph, the x-axis is the weight and the y-axis is the loss. So in, if I show you this, it kind of, it means that when the weight for our one uh, input is like 60, the loss is about like 30. Um, if we have a weight of like 200, the loss is about like 80 something. Um, and it seems like if like our weight is around 100, then this is the, like the smallest loss we can have. So this might be the point where um, our weight should be because like we want small loss, right? Um, right, so when we start up um, a network, the weights are always initialized randomly, or they always should be initialized randomly. And we start out anywhere. And then what the optimizer does is use the magic of math to kind of take steps and try to get to the, approximate the, the, um, the point where the loss is less, basically. Um, it's like a little more complicated than that, but the way that we can imagine this is that we're just taking steps towards, hopefully, the minimum. And um, the, the, uh, the, the closer we get to the minimum, the smaller the steps become as well. So this is kind of what we're doing when we're doing machine learning with um, deep learning JS. So for the optimizer to implement that, we need um, an algorithm. Again, I'm just picking the algorithm that's called gradient descent, which is which is doing what I just showed you. There are other optimizer algorithms, but again, uh, I would like, suggest to you that you just look into it yourself. And then we need a learning rate. The learning rate is just a parameter. It's a number that determines how big these steps are. So this is a small learning rate and this is a big learning rate. In this example, it kind of looks like the bigger learning rate is a problem because we're gonna move away from the minimum. Could be a problem, um, it's just something that you kind of have to try out for yourself uh, to see which learning rate is best suited for your problem. Uh, and again, the implementation is or was actually super simple. We just had to call deep learn and just say, give me the, I don't know what the S stands for, but give me the gradient descent optimizer and then just pass in a learning rate. That is basically it. So we already have our data, our network, and now we set up the training, and all we need to do is run. Now, all of you are kind of looking at me like, what? So how does it work, actually? I just, I, yeah, I understood what you said, but I still don't understand how it works. So I'm gonna try to show you how it actually works in a super nice diagram. Uh, so we start out with this, this is our network, and we have our data. All right, we're feeding in our well, data into our network. So this is, we're feeding it into the input. And then, you know, it computes stuff, blah, 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 and then it outputs three. That's our prediction. Then we look into our data again, and we find out the target was actually two. So what we have to do is calculate the distance. In this case, I'm just using subtraction. I mean, it's not what I used before. Like I said, it was another uh, algorithm, but in this case, to make it simple, the cost is just one, it's just a difference. Then we're feeding this one into our optimizer, and what the optimizer does is take the one and then magically goes back through the uh, network and changes all the weights. So when we go from the input to the back, it's called forward propagation because we propagate all the data forward, and then what the optimizer does is called backwards propagation because it propagates values backwards. The difference is 
when we do forward propagation, we take like actual inputs, like the feature inputs, pass it through to make a prediction. When we do backwards propagation, we're not actually caring about input values, we're using the cost to try to change the, the weights. So we're not actually doing anything with the prediction, we just, like, we just need the prediction to know how good our, um, our network is performing and then taking that information and then trying to change the weight in a way that it's gonna perform better next round. So this is basically the entire magic, which I hope is not that complicated anymore. I hope it makes sense to you now. Um, <clears throat> there's like, like I'm gonna show some uh, code on how to generate the training data, but it's the, the important thing here so I'm like generating uh, a bunch of training data here, is that the input data and the target data, data are in two separate arrays, and the way that they're um, referenced is just by the index. And they're like it's two separate arrays, that's the point. Uh, and also, we don't push just like normal arrays inside there, we have to push like these deep learn arrays. But like I said, I don't know, <laughs> I actually haven't looked into how it works in TensorFlow right now, like what you would have to call, but they actually have good uh, examples for that. You can sh just check it out. Anyway, so, um, so it's not that important what's happening here. It's kind of just that we have to put the training data that we uh, generated, have to put it in this like shuffled input provider. So it would shuffle the data for us, but the reference is still intact from the input to the target. That's basically all like, this slide shows. All right, so when we train it, when we run everything, now that we have everything, it's actually, it doesn't look that complicated anymore. We have to start a session, and we pass this math environment. And math basically tells you, if you are in the browser, you can utilize the GPU. If you're not in the browser, you have to use the CPU. And you know, it's, it's nice to have things in the GPU because it like, runs much faster and, uh, than, than you would uh, with the CPU. And then on this math environment, you call, I'm gonna train this, uh, the, okay, on the session, you call train, pass it, okay, you need the cost tensor, and you need the feed entries, which is the data. The batch size is basically just determining like, how many data points are we gonna iterate through right now. Um, the optimizer, you know, it, like, it takes the cost tensor and the network and then try to like change things, change the weights. And this last parameter is just, we just need it to output the, the cost, the loss that we have after each batch run. So this is the um, code. And the nice thing about you know, running in the browser is that you can utilize all the nice browser things like uh, the service workers and everything, so I, spun up a little demo, and I'm gonna just show you the video right now because it takes forever for, uh, to run, actually. So, um, like I said, we, what we wanted to achieve was to do complementary color uh, prediction, and in this case, um, the input color will always be this like, slight, like light purple, and this is our target color. This is the color that we want the machine to predict. This is the color that the machine is predicting right now. This is completely randomly set up, so this could be any color. It says cost zero here, but that's obviously wrong because cost zero would mean that we have the perfect prediction. Um, it should say cost one, but um, yeah, I didn't fix it and I thought it would be easier to just explain to you that it's not correct than to actually fix it. So let's uh, take a look at this video. So um, you can see that it's like slowly like changing the values and getting like better and you can also see that the uh, cost is getting smaller and smaller, and then at some point, so I'm running like a thousand batches here, I think. So I'm running like 25 batch size um, and doing it until I run a thousand batches. And here in the end, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it's like almost un indistinguishable, the difference. And I feel like uh, if we look at the beginning, it starts out like with this, and it like really gradually, really slowly kind of like approximates the actual value. And, but, Every time you set it up, it starts completely randomly, so I had to make a video of like a nice run that actually shows what I want to show. Um, but you know, you can, like I said, you can check out the repository and just try it for yourself. Uh, this was one um, example from Google, but they scrapped it with all the, um, with all the documentation and everything. So 
you kind of have to check out my specific repository for build to run. All right, uh, some links for you to check out. So first of all, that's the repository I was talking about. Then there's uh, Deep Learn JS, which is um, apparently not Deep Learn JS anymore, but it will take you to TensorFlow JS. Um, this is like a really nice uh, explanation. Uh, no, this is the demo, uh, which I don't actually know if it's still up or not. <laughs> so you have to see for yourself. Um, okay, this is a very nice explanation of some deep learning fundamentals uh, that I didn't cover, like what kind of activation function should I use, if you're interested in that. And, oh, it's the fonts. I didn't put in the uh, course. So uh, Coursera is the platform, and it's just called Stanford uh, Machine Learning Course. All right, I have to show the slide. We are hiring, uh, we have offices in those beautiful cities, so if you are interested in you know, doing cloud computing, which has nothing to do with what I was just talking about, uh, you can talk to me or just go to the website. Thank you, and then now, let's party. <laughs>